So, uh, and thank you all for finding some time to, to attend today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is some of my work on uh, quickly detecting and simultaneously classifying uh, changes in the uh, distribution of a uh, stochastic random process. So this problem uh, has been um, investigated under a number of different names. Uh, um, and one name I'll choose to use today is uh, quickest change diagnosis. So I'll give an overview of the problem. Uh, I'll then describe some of the approaches that have been uh, formulated and considered in the statistics literature or information theory literature. Uh, when the unknown changes, or rather when the change changes that need to be detected and classified are unknown uh, to within a, a finite set of candidates. Um, I'll then talk about the recent work that I've looked at um, in misspecified quickest change diagnosis and uh, mini max robust quickest change diagnosis, both of which uh, consider the case where the unknown changes uh, that need to be um, uh, detected and classified uh, belong to a potentially infinite uh, set of candidates. Okay, so first of all, just an overview. So our quickest change diagnosis involves sequentially observing a statistical process YK. Uh, initially, this process has a probability or is described by probability law uh, nu naught. This is the pre-change probability law. At some unknown change time lambda, the distribution of the process uh, changes to a post-change law. And uh, in quickest change diagnosis, that post-change law may be uh, one of J possible uh, candidates or change types, uh, new one to uh, new capital J. So the objective is to observe this process sequentially and then quickly detect the change in distribution from new naught uh, and simultaneously classify the post-change distribution as one of the uh, capital J uh, possible change types. There are obviously uh, numerous applications of this quickest change diagnosis problem. Uh, the most obvious perhaps being fault detection and isolation. For the, for this reason, it's also sometimes called uh, quickest change detection and isolation, uh, with the classification decision being essentially an isolation decision. Um, so in, under the name of fault detection and isolation, uh, it's been um, uh, quick change diagnosis has been investigated in numerous types of engineering systems, uh, ranging from power systems through to uh, navigation systems. Uh, surprisingly, though, I think a lot of the statistical uh, formulation and, and um, solutions for quick change diagnosis have been investigated or motivated by problems in communications, uh, foremost among those being uh, cognitive radio, where uh, secondary users seek to quickly detect uh, the absence of uh, primary users in the, in the available spectrum and potentially classify um, not only detect the free uh, spectrum, but also classify it in terms of perhaps the number of other uh, secondary users already using that gap. Uh, it also has applications in robotics. Uh, one of the most obvious being the detection of uh, wheel slip in odometry systems and the use of uh, wheel velocity uh, as, a, um, as a sensor. So, um, in a quickest change diagnosis scheme, the wheel velocity may be monitored for changes that would uh, reflect either wheel slip or, or a change in the traversability of the terrain. Uh, I particularly uh, became interested in quickest change diagnosis because of its application to maneuvering target tracking, where uh, not only is it desirable to quickly detect the maneuvers of targets that you may be observing, or tracking, but also simultaneously classify which of uh, a set of possible maneuvers the target may have performed, such as a, a climb, a descent, or a, or a turn, or an aggressive turn in the case of an aircraft. So despite these many applications, the quickest change diagnosis has uh, really only been formulated and rigorously solved uh, in statistical literature and in um, inf the information theory community relatively recently. Um, 
the one of the first formulations that I'm aware of uh, was uh, um, developed by Nikiforov in, in 1995. In Nikiforov's uh, quickest change diagnosis formulation, uh, we observe a process again with an unknown change time and a uh, finite number of possible change types. Um, so a, a finite number of possible uh, post-change distributions. Initially, the process is IID um, with distribution new naught. So new naught here is a, a marginal distribution of, of one of the um, uh, of the observations at one time step. Uh, and then after the change time, the observations are IID again, but with one of those uh, possible um, post-change distributions. A quickest change diagnosis algorithm uh, under this formulation can then be fully described by a stopping time. So that's the time at which the um, uh, algorithm declares that a change has occurred and a classification decision made at the, at the um, same time at which the algorithm declares a change. And that classification decision is, is simply um, that uh, which one of the J possible changes uh, has occurred, at least um, so far as the algorithm believes. Uh, so both um, the uh, stopping time and the terminal classification decision of a uh, QCDI algorithm are measurable with respect to filtration generated by the observations. So what that means is um, simply that the, the decision to stop and declare a change and the decision as to which of the changes occurred uh, is fully determined by the observations up to including the current time. There's no um, break in causality for these algorithms. They, they need to only make um, decisions about the change uh, um, type and the presence of the change using uh, information up to and including the current time. Uh, with that in mind, so with the, the idea that this, these algorithms have a stopping time and a, and a terminal decision, then the performance of them can be characterized really by two types of events. First of all, a delay quantity. So that delay quantity is, um, can be thought of like at the core of it. It's, it's just the difference between when the algorithm stops and when the change occurred. So um, the difference between capital T and the change time lambda. Um, uh, Nikiforov chooses to include a, a plus one here to um, signify that if a change occurs or is detected at the change time, then one observation from the post-change distribution has been received. So essentially that's a, it's kind of a delay of one. Um, uh, the second event though that can be used or should be used to um, describe the performance of a QCDI algorithm is the false alarm or false classification event. And that event corresponds to um, declaring or the decision of the algorithm being that a type J change has occurred when in fact a type I change may have occurred when uh, I is not equal to J. Um, a false alarm obviously corresponds to when a, a, um, uh, a change is detected. So when D is uh, not equal to zero, but the um, type has actually been type zero change um, for, a, for a no change. So that's Okay, so um, the issue with, or well, these are events really in, in, in the language of probability. Um, so they are random or um, the delay in particular is a, is a random variable. Uh, and, and so is the, the decision. Um, so what Nikiforov needed to do is uh, take those random variables and wrap them up into a, into a deterministic um, criteria. Uh, so um, what was done in the case of um, the delay Nikiforov proposed this maximum expected delay of an algorithm at the core and just on the right hand side within the expectation of this equation, because I realize it looks um, somewhat horrendous. Uh, but at the core of this is the delay. So the difference between the, the time the algorithm stops and the change time. So the, the time the algorithm stops t is a, is a random variable um, and the change time is unknown. So just sticking with the random variable at the moment though t, um, to uh, change that into uh, more of a deterministic variable, um, we take the expectation. So we take the expected delay uh, 
over um, sequences that initially have a pre-change distribution uh, nu naught, uh, post-change distribution nu j, and when the change occurs at, at time lambda. So that's what those uh, superscripts and subscripts on the expectation mean. It means we're taking the expectation on sequences with a pre-change distribution of nu naught, a post-change distribution of nu j, and a uh, change at, at time uh, lambda. Um, it's a conditional expectation uh, over um, a conditioned on the uh, pre-change observations, um, or the technically the filtration generated by those pre-change observations. Uh, because we don't know the change time, we don't know the change type J, and we don't know the pre-change observations, uh, we essentially take the, the max, we maximize the delay quantity or the expected delay quantity over those three unknowns. So the E soup is over the uh, pre-change observations, the soup is over the unknown uh, change time, and the max is over the unknown change type. Um, so I realize that delay quantity is, is somewhat um, uh, convoluted, but it, it's there because, or it looks that way because of the uh, unknowns in the um, in the in the problem. The second uh, part of uh, Nikiforos formulation in terms of um, describing the performance of a um, QCDI algorithm uh, is the mean time to false alarm or, or false classification, um, and that this quantity is a, is a little easier to explain. At the core of it, it's simply um, describing the time it takes for the algorithm to declare a J-type change on sequences that were in fact generated by a, a distribution new I. Um, so that's what the notation on the expectation here represents, uh, that the sequence is drawn entirely from a, a distribution new I where I might be uh, zero to, to capital J. Um, so it's essentially the time it takes for the algorithm to stop and declare a J type change when in fact an I type change was true. Um, again, the, the change J and, and um, is unknown. So there's a, a minimum mean time to false alarm. So a worst case mean time to false alarm uh, that, that we choose to use um, in the key four of formulation. Uh, so with those two delay and, and false alarm uh, and false isolation quantities defined, uh, the formulation um, of uh, QCDI proposed by Nikiforov in 95 was to find um, the algorithm that uh, has minimum delay subject to its mean time to false alarm or false isolation being greater than some um, given uh, constraint um, gamma. When there is only one possible change distribution, so when um, capital J is equal to one, then uh, quickest change diagnosis actually reduces to a, a binary hypothesis testing type problem um, known as quickest change detection. So detection meaning that we're not interested in also making an isolation decision or a classification decision because that, that's trivial here. We, we only have one possible post change distribution. Um, so QCDI when J equals one is the simpler problem of testing a no change hypothesis H naught versus an alternative uh, change hypothesis that a change has occurred to, to new one. Um, the reason it's interesting to look at this um, uh, uh, simplified formulation of QCDI is because its solution is well known and has been well known since about the 1970s. Um, it is solved by a, a QSUM algorithm, uh, where the QSUM algorithm is um, uh, defined by a stopping time, um, written, written on this side, but just to explain it, um, the QSUM algorithm stops the first time that its test statistic SK exceeds the threshold H. And that test statistic is nothing more than the likelihood ratio uh, between um, the change hypothesis H1 um, and the no change hypothesis H0. Um, going through the maths, it's, it's uh, interesting to note um, that the QSUM algorithm test statistic is actually purely recursive. So the statistic at time K is the positive part of the statistic at time K minus one, uh, plus the uh, log likelihood ratio between the uh, 
um, marginal of the post change divided by the marginal of the uh, pre change. Um, so that's the solution to Nikiforov's formulation of quickest change diagnosis when um, there's only one possible post change distribution. So when the um, detection decision, uh, sorry, when the decision as to which change occurred is trivial. Um, operationally, what the QSUM algorithm test statistic looks like is before a change, the test statistic remains close to zero. And then after a change, so here at, at time 60, after the change time, the uh, test statistic increases um, until it reaches um, the threshold H, at which time a change is declared. Um, the reason for the positive trend after a change is due to that log likelihood ratio between the um, post-change distribution divided by the, the pre-change distribution or the post-change likelihood divided by the pre-change likelihood. Okay, so a matrix QSUM algorithm is actually an extension of QSUM um, that solves the quickest change diagnosis problem when um, the number of um, post-change uh, candidates is uh, greater than one. So the matrix QSUM algorithm, it, it, it can be written in, in a fairly complicated manner using stopping times, but I'm just going to describe it, its operation here. Essentially, it involves calculating a matrix of QSUM test statistics. So um, uh, in, in this matrix shown here, just note that each column, in each column, the uh, second distribution in the QSUM test statistic is held um, constant. Uh, the reason for that, if you recall the, in the QSUM algorithm itself, um, the second statistic or second distribution in the QSUM test statistic was actually the, uh, the H1 or the alternative distribution. Um, uh, a matrix QSUM algorithm declares a change um, of type J when all of the test statistics in the Jth column uh, are greater than the threshold H. Um, so what that means looking at the QSUM test statistic is um, the alternative distribution in each being tested in each column or with each column is the, the J alternative and the null hypothesis, which corresponds to the uh, first distribution in those QSUM test statistics uh, is essentially that um, a change other than the type J change has occurred. Um, uh, so what's important to note with this uh, matrix QSUM algorithm uh, as presented here and as this asymptotic solution uh, to Nikiforos formulation of QCDI uh, in the asymptotic regime of few false alarms and few isolation decisions uh, is that the distributions are, are completely specified and need to be completely uh, known um, in order to formulate this, uh, this, uh, this algorithm. Um, I do want to highlight that all of the uh, optimality results, um, uh, so all of the algorithms known to solve Nikiforov's uh, formulation of QCDI um, are only known to solve them, uh, are only known to solve that formulation in asymptotic regime as the um, mean time to false alarm or false isolation constraint goes to uh, infinity. Um, that's obviously the um, regime where we'd like to operate these rules though. Um, so it's not an entirely practical limitation, uh, but it is worth noting the, um, the, uh, the, the limits of, of the theory at the moment in this uh, somewhat idealized case. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, MQSUM is the solution or asymptotic solution to Nikiforos formulation. Um, and its uh, optimal delay um, is uh, asymptotically the uh, log of the um, mean time to false alarm and false isolation constraint gamma divided by the uh, minimum uh, relative entropy between the possible uh, post-change distributions and the um, uh, 
uh, other post-change plus pre-change distributions. Um, so that uh, just reminding that um, you all of what the relative entropy is because it plays an important part in in the discussion um, that I'm going to have. Uh, um, it's defined as this um, uh, integral. Um, and uh, it has a pseudo distance uh, interpretation since it's non negative uh, for all um, pairs of distributions. And it's uh, zero if and only if the, the distributions are, are equal in, um, I guess, an almost sure sense. The reason this relative entropy pops up as such an important um, quantity in uh, quickest change diagnosis uh, is due to those QSUM test statistics. Um, the relative entropy is actually expected uh, increment in the uh, QSUM test statistic um, when uh, the uh, observations are drawn from um, the uh, alternate distribution, so the second distribution in the QSUM test statistic pair. Um, so with that observation, I'm just going to give a little bit more intuition as to what that uh, asymptotically optimal delay of the MQ sum real means. Um, so MQ sum test statistics behave the same as, as Q sum test statistics essentially after a, after a change. Um, so if we look at a Q sum test statistic um, between uh, change type I and change type J, where J is actually the, the true change type, after the change time here, 15, then this QSUM test statistic will increase um, after the change time. Uh, and its expected slope will actually be that um, the, the expectation under the uh, post-change distribution, so in, um, new J, uh, of the log likelihood ratio between um, new J and, and, and new I. And that's the, the relative entropy, uh, new, new J to new I. Um, the threshold of the QSUM test assist, uh, the, yeah, the threshold of the matrix QSUM, if we take that as the log of the um, mean time to false alarm and false isolation constraint, uh, then we can get the delay, the delay or the roughly the expected time we would expect the uh, uh, test statistic to exceed the threshold after a change would be that threshold, so log gamma divided by the uh, expected slope, um, which is the relative entropy. So that's exactly what the um, asymptotic uh, optimal delay of matrix QSUM uh, is, uh, roughly speaking, but minimized over the, um, the, uh, the change types. Okay. All of that discussion and all of those optimality results have been developed under the assumption that the pre-change distribution is known exactly, and that the possible post-change distributions are also uh, known and, and specified. Um, it also implicitly in, assumes that, um, or in that construction, uh, the possible post-change distributions have also obviously been restricted to only a finite uh, set of candidates. The question that is then um, obvious, perhaps for a practitioner, is: But what if the pre-change distribution is unknown, and what if those possible post-change distributions are also unknown? Um, what do we do? Do we learn them? Uh, and that's uh, an approach that has been proposed to use maximum likelihood uh, parameter estimation um, or parameter estimates of those distributions in place of them in the matrix QSUM algorithm. That leads to what's known as the generalized likelihood ratio algorithm. Uh, I've written on this slide um, somewhat crudely the, what that looks like if all of the change types are unknown. Um, it, it, it really does get out of hand, uh, not only because we're estimating J plus one distributions, but we also need to remember that the QSUM algorithm is implicitly uh, um, maximizing a likelihood ratio over the unknown change time. So it's considering all possible unknown change times. So if we consider all possible unknown change times and, and all possible um, uh, unknown distributions, then the generalized likelihood ratio um, 
test or this idea of learning the distributions from the observations just becomes uh, completely intractable. Um, we no longer have nice recursive forms for the Q sum test statistics. Um, furthermore, um, the theoretical properties of the generalized likelihood ratio algorithm in uh, Crick's change diagnosis are um, somewhat lacking. Uh, Lai in 2000 established some uh, limited theoretical results for GLR, um, but those fall short of uh, asymptotic optimality when the number of change types is, is greater than one. Um, so relatively recently, uh, uh, quickest change diagnosis approaches have been proposed though to avoid this idea of estimating or learning the, the unknown change um, distributions or pre-change distribution. Um, and roughly speaking, there's, there's two approaches that, that we've looked at. Um, the first being designing MQSUM using nominal, admittedly incorrect distributions and bounding the performance loss. Um, the second approach is actually pursuing a more principled uh, minimax robust design approach where we seek to uh, optimize the worst case performance over um, sets of possible distributions. Um, so these sets, uh, we may have an uncertainty set for each of the possible post-change distributions, for example, as well as the pre-change distribution. So much of the material I'm going to talk about in the remainder of this talk will be drawn from this uh, 2020 TAC article. And I'll start with a, a description of misspecified uh, quickest change diagnosis and, and some of the results um, that have been established. Um, so going back to the matrix QSUM algorithm, uh, most generally, it can be considered to involve a matrix of QSUM test statistics uh, between um, J squared minus J arbitrary pairs of distributions. So we don't necessarily need to use the true distributions. Um, I guess if we don't have them, we don't have a choice. Um, but we can also break the paradigm that we use the same pairs to test the same change type in each, uh, in each column. Um, so uh, what I'm saying is that uh, um, looking at a misspecified matrix QSUM test, we could potentially have uh, every pair in, um, uh, used to generate the QSUM test statistics uh, involve different um, pre-change and, and post-change uh, distributions. Um, obviously, when MQSUM is correctly specified in the sense that the pairs match the true distributions, then what we have um, is that the first element of the um, pairs correspond to um, a type I change distribution, and the second element in, in the pairs correspond to a type J. Um, uh, nevertheless, if, if um, we do have a, a horrendously, potentially horrendously misspecified MQ sum algorithm, um, some obvious questions I would like answered is, well, is the MQSUM uh, delay bounded? And um, can MQSUM still satisfy its mean time to false alarm, false isolation constraint uh, if um, we're not using the true distributions? And in fact, if we're not even um, uh, matching uh, the distributions we use to test different types across different um, columns. Um, so the first theorem um, that I'll just present the result of uh, bounds the uh, delay of misspecified uh, matrix QSUM algorithms. Um, um, so we just suppose that the uh, true distributions generating the process uh, um, belong to this, uh, this collection new. Um, the pre-change distribution new one and the, and the possible post-change distributions new uh, one to new capital J. Um, however, if the um, matrix QSUM algorithm eta hat here um, is designed with an arbitrary set of pairs or it's almost arbitrary set of pairs, um, then, the, then it's uh, 
it's delay under the Nikiforov delay criteria is uh, upper bounded, so less than or equal to um, the uh, threshold value of the MQ sum divided by the um, uh, minimum uh, difference in relative entropy between the um, true post change distribution, nu j, and the uh, first element of a pair, um, v, v bar naught, uh, minus the, the relative entropy, um, nu j, uh, to the second element of the pair, uh, v bar. So um, that denominator, it, it does need to be positive. So that is the one condition of this theorem. Uh, and I'll just talk through what that actually means um, because the denominator, um, it, it does look uh, somewhat intimidating. Um, so the denominator being, being the condition, we can actually flip it. We need that denominator to be positive. And in fact, we need the, the minimum distance, uh, minimum difference in those relative entropies to be um, greater than zero or um, positive. Um, rearranging then what we're essentially saying is that we need the relative entropy of the uh, true distribution or um, nu j um, to the uh, first distribution in each pair um, to be greater than the uh, relative entropy of um, nu j to the second distribution in, in each pair used to design the MQ sum algorithm. Uh, so intuitively what's that set, what that is saying is that the um, true post change distribution really needs to be closer to the, the distributions which we're using to test the post change um, in the MQ sum algorithm than, um, than it is to the distributions that we are using to test for a type I change. So that's somewhat, somewhat intuitive. Um, we can't be testing for a change type if um, the uh, other change types are actually closer to the distribution we're using to, to test for it um, in a relative entropy sense, of course. Um, the second misspecified result we can obtain answers the question, okay, if MQ sum is um, misspecified, can it still satisfy a mean time to false alarm or false isolation constraint? Again, the setup is, is similar to our um, bound on MQ sums misspecified detection delay, where we have a, um, we suppose that the distributions generating the process are actually from this collection new, um, with the pre-change distribution new naught and um, the post-change distribution one of new one to, to new capital J. Uh, the MQ sum algorithm is designed with some arbitrary pairs again, or almost arbitrary pairs. We'll, we'll discuss the conditions on them. And it does satisfy um, a, a mean time to false um, and false isolation constraint. Um, uh, so it's mean time to false alarm or false isolation constraint will be greater than or equal to um, e to the h, where h is its threshold. Um, whenever this, uh, this condition at the bottom holds, and this condition at the bottom is really saying that the, the log likelihood rate, sorry, not even the log, just the likelihood ratio between the um, uh, first distribution, sorry, the second distribution in each pair divided by the first distribution in each pair is, is on average less than, uh, less than one. Um, so that condition to ensure uh, a bounded um, or constrained mean time to false alarm or false isolation for a misspecified uh, matrix Q sum algorithm um, is, a, is a little, little more difficult to um, get some intuition about. Um, but by taking logarithms and applying Jensen's inequality, we actually get a necessary condition for this, um, this condition um, in terms of the relative entropy. And that necessary condition, which I've written here in the second unnumbered equation, is saying essentially the, a, a complementary uh, insight to, to the insight we had for the um, worst case uh, or the misspecified delay. Uh, this is saying, this condition is saying that um, the true um, I type uh, or pre-change or null distribution, um, new I, actually has to be closer to the um, first distribution in each pair uh, 
used to um, detect an eye type change uh, than it is to the distribution, the second distribution in each pair, um, which are used to detect the, the J type change. Um, so just a summary of the misspecified uh, results then, um, a condition for bounded misspecified Q sum delay is that um, the uh, true distribution, the true um, J type distribution needs to be closer to the um, second um, distribution in each pair used to design uh, MQ sum than to um, the first distribution in each pair used to design um, MQ sum. Uh, the condition for the constrained mean time to false alarm is that the um, uh, true I type distribution for I not equal to J has to be closer to the first distribution in each pair used to design MQ sum than it is to the second distribution of each pair. Um, these misspecified results, um, they can look like, I mean, they're, they're interesting in their own uh, right, but they also lead to a surprising new MQ sum optimality result. Um, so uh, if we suppose again, that the true distributions are um, from this collection new and they generate the, the observation process and um, that there exist some pairs, um, V bar, that satisfy um, this inequality between um, uh, this relative entropy inequality, where on the left-hand side, we look at the relative entropy between the true distributions, which um, we can recall is the denominator of the delay of the asymptotic optimal QSUM algorithm. If that um, is equal to the um, uh, denominator from our asymptotic upper bound on the misspecified QSUM delay, um, and if we can guarantee that those pairs satisfy the mean time to false alarm false isolation constraint, then um, the misspecified Q sum algorithm, mis, uh, MQ sum algorithm designed with these pairs will actually be asymptotically optimal in Nikiforov's, um, uh, under Nikiforov's formulation. Um, the reason for that is, is um, uh, that first inequality really, the second inequality is nice, but it's just to make sure that the, the MQ sum um, satisfies the constraint. Um, the first inequality, uh, is uh, um, simply that the uh, upper bound on the detection delay is the same as the optimal um, or minimum uh, um, delay uh, established um, in the optimality results. Um, so that's possible when there's no misspecification in, in that um, minimum or for other arrangements. Um, uh, we, Um, so that new asymptotic optimality result um, is um, interesting because the original optimality result of Oscar Poor and Poor for matrix Q sum under Nikki Forrest formulation actually required all the distributions in MQ sum to correspond to the true unknown distributions. Uh, our new optimality result may actually only require that some of the distributions, if any, uh, match the true distributions. Um, uh, this result I'm going to uh, quickly show actually enables um, a new minimax robust approach to QCDI. So not only is this result interesting in its own right, it's actually a building block for um, solving a, a minimax robust version of uh, quick exchange detection and isolation. Um, so I'll, I'll just briefly introduce what, uh, what I mean by minimax robust quickest change diagnosis. Um, so to set up a minimax robust quickest change diagnosis problem, uh, we suppose that the pre-change and post-change distributions are unknown, uh, but that they each are known to belong to uh, an uncertainty set, um, P naught to, to P capital J. Um, so the true distributions, as, as I've shown there, are somewhere within these uncertainty sets. Uh, but we don't know the, the true distribution, all we know are the uncertainty sets. Um, we can look at then the worst case delay. So we can take Nikiforov's um, delay criteria and we can maximize that over the um, 
possible uh, pre-change and post-change distributions from the uncertainty set, and that gives us a description of the worst case delay or maximum delay. Uh, and we can also talk about the worst case mean time to false alarm or false isolation. Um, and uh, that um, is equivalent to taking the um, uh, mean time to false alarm, false isolation from Nikiforos formulation and maximizing that over the changes that can occur um, or the distributions that, that can be uh, found in the uncertainty sets. So in a minimax robust quick change diagnosis formulation, um, we can see a um, algorithm that minimizes the uh, worst case delay over the distributions in the uncertainty sets, uh, subject to um, that algorithm having a mean time to false alarm or false isolation uh, that is uh, greater than um, a constraint gamma for all possible values of the uh, distributions in the uncertainty sets. Again, because all results here are um, asymptotic, we'll, we'll stick to the asymptotic solution. Um, and I'll just sketch the solution approach because it's somewhat intuitive, but basically for any algorithm, um, detection and classification of the smallest changes or changes that look the most similar to each other from amongst those in the uncertainty sets uh, will take the longest to, to detect. So that's somewhat uh, obvious, I, I think. If we um, are trying to detect a very small change, um, we're going to have to wait a long time. Um, similarly, if we're going to try and separate two changes that look very similar, we're going to have to also wait a long time um, to gather enough evidence to say that those changes uh, are different in order to determine which of those change types it actually, the change actually is. So for any algorithm, uh, the focus when talking about its worst case delay will be on the smallest changes or the changes that look most similar to each other from amongst the uncertainty sets. Um, an optimal algorithm, so for example, the vanilla QSUM or our new misspecified um, matrix QSUM, designed for these smallest or most similar changes will hence minimize the maximum delay. Uh, so we know um, the vanilla MQSUM or our new um, misspecified MQSUM um, uh, can minimize the detection delay given the distribution. So if we design them with distributions that represent the smallest and most similar changes, uh, we can optimize the worst case delay. Uh, and the last uh, point is what is meant by smallest and most similar changes. Uh, well, loosely speaking, they can be described using uh, relative entropy. Um, namely, we can talk about the smallest change being um, that which minimizes the relative entropy between the pre-change distribution and uh, all of the other po possible post-change distributions. We can talk about the most similar change um, being the uh, change that minimizes the relative entropy between um, the uncertainty sets which represent um, possible post-change distributions. Um, so if we can identify those, we can, um, by solving these relative entropy um, equations or relationships uh, offline, then we can use them to design either vanilla MQSUM or um, use a um, specified MQSUM algorithm, uh, and that will lead to a, a minimax robust uh, solution. Okay, so I'll just present an example. Um, uh, so let's consider a case where the, the process is um, a uh, multivariate Gaussian process, um, so uh, a vector process um, is two-dimensional observations, um, so yk is in R, R2, um, and the only change that occurs at some unknown change time is a change in mean of this Gaussian process. Um, there are uh, two possible change types. So before a change, um, the uh, mean of this Gaussian process will be um, somewhere between uh, negative infinity and zero. Um, so on the right, I've plotted the uh, um, uncertainty sets I'm going to describe in terms of the, the mean vector. So in um, before the change, the mean belongs to the uncertainty set P naught, which is down in the um, third quadrant. Uh, after a change, um, the uh, mean of the process can either be 
within the uncertainty set P1, uh, which is described by a mean um, between 0 0.4 and 0 0.8. Uh, and, or it could be in a type two change in the uncertainty set P2 with a mean between uh, 1.5 and, and infinity, positive infinity. Um, so just a, uh, this sort of detection problem can appear in detecting changes, additive changes in um, linear state space systems. Um, uh, so the smallest or, or most similar changes between the uncertainty sets in this case uh, correspond to the vertices of the um, uncertainty sets. And that's because um, the relative entropy in this case um, is just, I think, the square or, or the, you, the square of, or the, actually the uh, Euclidean norm between the, the mean vectors. Um, so to identify those smallest or most similar changes, um, for testing P naught, uh, so for testing a, a change of type one, um, we have the vertices of uh, um, Gaussian uh, mean zero and Gaussian uh, mean 0 0.4. That would be to detect a type one change. Um, that would take the longest. To detect a type two change, uh, it would take the longest to decide between a, um, a pre-change distribution with mean zero and a post-change distribution with mean 1.5. So those vertices are, are the um, smallest represent the smallest change. To decide between a um, type one change or, or a type two change, um, the vertices would be uh, Gaussian mean 0 0.8 and uh, Gaussian with mean uh, 1.5. Um, and that would be symmetric. So deciding in favor of a type one change versus deciding in favor of type two change would, would use the same distributions. Um, what is interesting to note though, is that in this case, we do have to make use of our misspecified uh, matrix Q sum rule. And that's because um, there are two um, distributions or the distributions that we need to um, test for a type one change change, depending on whether we're trying to detect the change or whether we're trying to um, isolate it or um, classify it in comparison to a type two change. Um, that's that's a that's a subtle point. Um, okay, so how does once we've got those least variable distributions how, or those um, smallest changes, how do we actually go and practice? Um, so on the left, just focusing on the left graph here, this is the estimated delay of the um, of a number of algorithms on that Gaussian process. Um, against different possible change types drawn from the uh, uh, post-change um, distribution when it's a type one change. Um, we can see for all of the algorithms that, that we examine, the maximum delay occurs when that change in mean is the smallest, is 0 0.4. Um, after, so for other changes, for other type one changes here, that delay is, is uh, smaller than the delay at, at 0 0.4. Um, the algorithms we're comparing to, we compare an asymptotically optimal rule. So that asymptotically optimal rule has knowledge of what the, the true change is. Um, our asymptotically robust rule is, is in red and um, two different generalized likelihood ratio algorithms with different computational complexities are um, shown in magenta and cyan. Um, so what's interesting, just looking at the left graph still, is that the asymptotically robust rule um, has the same delay as the asymptotically optimal rule at this worst case distribution or at this worst case uh, detection delay, which is what we designed for. We wanted the, the rule to be minimax robust. We wanted to minimize the maximum delay. Um, what's interesting though is that the uh, asymptotically robust rule remains quite close to the asymptotically optimal for these non-worst case or non-maximum uh, detection delays in the case of a type one change. Um, so that's, and of course it beats the GLR algorithm, which is um, much, much more computation expensive than the, the recursive asymptotically robust and asymptotically optimal rule here. Um, looking over at the right, this is, um, these are the delays when a, a type two change actually occurs. Um, and uh, we can see that um, 
sometimes the generalized likelihood ratio rule does outperform the um, asymptotically optimal rule for these non-worst case changes. Um, all of these delays are obviously much smaller than the, the delay of detecting the type one changes. Um, but even if the generalized likelihood ratio algorithm does outperform the robust rule here, uh, it does so with an enormous uh, um, extra computational effort and when the stakes are, are much, much lower. The difference in the delays is, is now almost nothing. It's now maybe one time step. Um, so uh, in this presentation, I just gave an overview of optimal quick change diagnosis. I described the matrix QSUM algorithm as an optimal or asymptotically optimal solution to quickest change diagnosis, uh, and that it has some interesting misspecified uh, performance properties um, that make it useful in practice, uh, and which um, enable it to be used as the foundation of a, of a new asymptotically uh, minimax or bus um, quickest change diagnosis approach. Uh, so potential future work, some of the robust versions um, or robust ideas could be extended to other formulations of quickest change diagnosis. And there may be le less conservative alternatives um, for um, quickest change diagnosis instead of uh, minimax robust. So thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Tim. If there are any questions for Tim. We have time for maybe one quick question. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, this is Julia here. Thanks, Tim, for your nice presentation. Uh, so uh, you mentioned in this, uh, you, you would like to have that e uh, equality where the misspecified delay is equal to the one way distribution. And actually, what's the conclusion there? Can you can you give some non-trivial uh, condition under which uh, those two are the same in general? So the misspecified, sorry, what was this? The was it this result? Yes, yes. So, so the first inequality. So, are there any like non-trivial cases where this is true when you really don't know the uh, true, distrib true distributions, or or uh, some choices of this uh, 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 V bar uh, that this this holds? Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, I guess the key is that if you can identify the, um, if you know the closest true distributions, if that makes sense, then that's going to be quite easy. Then you just, um, your V-bar, you can just choose your V-bar to match those um, closest true distributions, yeah. right? So that's, uh, I guess that's so somewhat of a, um, that, that could be a trivial situation, but it de I guess it depends on how many possible changes you have. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> right now, you know, yeah, I guess I can imagine this, but other than like more general conditions under which uh, this is true or? Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's unclear. I um, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think sometimes you get lucky maybe and sometimes you don't. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Okay, thanks everyone and thanks team. And Hopefully I see you whenever I see you. Thanks.